I want to welcome everybody here today um, to our first uh, BB&T Free Market Process Speaker Series for fall. Um, you've been given uh, signing cards on your way in and a questionnaire, so if you uh, uh, professors offered you um, extra credit, we'll make sure that that gets back to them. And if not, we encourage you to fill them out for attendance purposes. Questionnaires are there as well, so that we can get some feedback um, on the speakers. And if you're interested, there's information um, about the initiative on the tables on your way out. So grab uh, information about um, brochures and, and other uh, ways in which you can get uh, opportunities for you to get involved. For those of you who do not know me, I'm Professor Peter Calcano. I'm the director of the Initiative for Public Choice and Market Process. The mission of the Initiative of Public Choice and Market Process is to advance the understanding of economic, political, and moral foundations of a free society. We do this variety of ways, including the speaker series, faculty research, student research opportunities. So I encourage you to look at our webpage, uh, check us out on Facebook. Our speaker today is Professor Lawrence White, who specializes in theory of history and, and banking and money, history of banking and money. Um, Professor White received his AB from Harvard University and his PhD from UCLA. Prior to joining the faculty at George Mason University, he's taught at schools such as New York University, University of Georgia, and University of Missouri in St. Louis. He is the author of three books, and I believe a fourth on the way out, um, including one on competition and currency, and is the editor of several volumes, including a three-volume set on free banking. His articles um, on theory of money and banking uh, Monetary theory and banking history have appeared in leading economic journals such as the American Economic Journal, Journal of Economic Literature, and the Journal of Money, Credit, and Banking. It's my great pr privilege to introduce to you today Professor Larry White, who's going to talk to us about Federal Reserve policy and the financial crisis. Uh, thanks, Pete. How, how long are we going? About uh, 15 minutes. Okay. Always good to know. All right, well, thank you. Uh, it's great to be in Charleston. Uh, it's great to be in the Wachovia Auditorium, given that I'm talking about the financial crisis and some of the fallout from that. Um, and I want to talk specifically about the role of the Federal Reserve System. Uh, but just to uh, clear the groundwork to begin with, I want to say that the housing bubble and the fallout from the bursting of the housing bubble uh, were not the results of a laissez-faire monetary system, as you may have heard in some places. Uh, we didn't have a laissez-faire monetary system or financial system. Right? The crisis happened in a system with an unanchored fiat money controlled by a government central bank uh, and a seriously restricted financial system. And my view is that if we'd had a laissez-faire monetary system, it would have been a lot less trouble-prone and more robust than the system we've got today, if you want to call it a system. It's sort of an interventionist chaos, really. Uh, if I have time, I'll, I'll talk a little more about the alternative to our current system. Uh, but mostly I want to focus on the Federal Reserve's role before the crisis and during the crisis and sort of where we are today. Uh, some of the details of what I'm saying you can find in a piece I had in the Cato Journal in fall 2010 entitled Federal Reserve Policy and the housing bubble. All right, so let me start with the Fed during the boom. Uh, the boom really begins with Federal Reserve policy, with the moves the Federal Reserve made coming out of the dot-com recession uh, in 2001. And maybe you've heard this phrase before, but the Fed kept interest rates too low for too long. That's a phrase I've repeated too many times. Uh, keeping interest rates low pushed asset prices high, uh, and the overly cheap, loanable funds the Fed created went overwhelmingly or, or predominantly into the housing uh, market, and then the bubble burst. Now, uh, commentators uh, have sometimes realized that you know many books have been written, some documentaries have been made about private miscalculation uh, during the crisis, imprudence in private financial institutions, banks, investment banks. And there's no question that that made things worse, and we can name the institutions for which it made things worse, Bear Stearns, Lehman, AIG, 
Wachovia, uh, IndyMac, Countrywide, and to some extent Citibank and Bank of America, although they were kept open. The, the imprudence or the mistaken strategies by these particular institutions help explain why they got into more trouble than other institutions, but that can't be the whole story because we're not trying to explain individual institution problems, we're trying to explain an industry-wide problem. The entire financial system that got into trouble. Uh, the phrase that's sometimes used, there was a cluster of errors. Uh, and to identify the causes of an industry-wide problem, we need something that has industry-wide effects. Uh, we need to identify price distortions or incentive distortions that are capable of having industry-wide effects. And that's where Fed, Federal Reserve policy comes in and to some extent uh, housing policy comes in. Uh, one way to summarize the point is to say that when you see bankers making crazy decisions, you have to ask uh, who supplied the crazy juice? Uh, or it's in central banker talk, who spiked the punch bowl? And it's the Federal Reserve. I mean, during the boom, the Fed pursued a very expansionary monetary policy that supplied cheap credit. Uh, that couldn't last in real terms uh, because money illusion doesn't last forever. Right? Uh, cheap money starts to end when inflation premiums start to drive interest rates up. Approximately, of course, if the Fed becomes concerned about inflation and they start tightening monetary policy, that brings the boom to the end, and that's what the Fed did in 2005, 2006. Uh, so that's the, the supply side of the credit market. Why was there so much demand uh, for mortgage credit? And that's where the role of uh, housing regulation comes in. It's mainly because of regulatory mandates and subsidies that exaggerated the demand for mortgages, and especially the demand for high-risk mortgages, subprime mortgages. That's where the marginal borrowers are. So if, uh, because there was a federal policy to expand home ownership, expand the number of people with mortgages, that's where you're gonna get the additional mortgage borrowers. Uh, and traditional criteria of credit worthiness were played down, uh, I mean, quite deliberately. Probably the most important uh, way in which they were, uh, credit worthiness was de-emphasized was that the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, gave Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the two housing uh, giants, the, the government-sponsored enterprises that buy mortgages from mortgage originators and either hold them or pass them on to investors. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have a very special privilege well, they're now in receivership, so maybe I should put this in the past tense, had a very special and valuable privilege, was, which was that their uh, debts were guaranteed by the federal government. So people with money to lend were happy to lend it to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac at interest rates only slightly above uh, what the Treasury was paying. Uh, so it was virtually no risk of not getting paid back. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac then take those funds and push them into the housing market, the Department of Housing and Urban Development imposed on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac quotas for mortgages to low-income borrowers, so-called affordable housing mandates. Of course, they did the exact opposite of making housing more affordable. Uh, but that amplified the uh, supply of subprime mortgages and the demand by financial institutions to acquire those mortgages. So basically there's a credit supply bubble, and I say bubble not in the sense that it's self-generating, but in the sense that it was on an unsustainable path. Now what's the role of the Fed in this? Well I'm blaming the Fed for starting the bubble, but that's not the story you hear of course from Federal Reserve spokesmen. Right? So for example, Governor, uh, Governor Donald Cohn of the Fed, when he's written about the housing bubble. He says, well, it raises a difficult question. Should the Fed try to actively pop uh, or burst a growing bubble? And if so, how do we identify it? But that whole way of looking at it takes it for granted that the bubble is just growing on its own with no uh, causation coming from the Fed. It's independent of monetary policy. And then the Fed has to decide whether to step in. Uh, but I think the way to look at it is uh, the Fed's policy tends to 
inflate asset bubbles. And so our challenge is to formulate or reformulate monetary policy or monetary institutions more fundamentally to avoid that kind of tendency. Uh, if we want a non-bubble prone monetary policy, uh, my own phrase for this is a non-effervescent monetary policy, but that hasn't really caught on. Uh, there are different ways to approach it. There isn't a lot of consensus about the best way to formulate monetary policy to avoid this problem. But I think everybody's agreed that the best policy is not to do what the Fed actually did, which was to hold interest rates too low for too long from 2001 to uh, 2005. Uh, and it's probably not to have the Fed ignore asset prices. Uh, and my view is not that the Fed should be looking for bubbles to pop, but that the Fed should be looking for feedback as to when its own policy is inflating bubbles and deliberately ignoring asset prices as though the consumer price index told the Fed everything it needs to know about Federal Reserve policy. I think that's a mistake. So let me be more specific about what the Fed did. Um, as I said, the Fed in the recession of 2001 began more aggressively expanding the money supply. There was a famous book about Alan Greenspan that called him the maestro. I'm waiting for a revisionist book that calls him Mr. Bubble. <laughs> I think that's more appropriate now. Uh, growth in the M2 monetary aggregate, to take just one figure, rose about 10% a year, which was quite a bit higher than normal. And it remained above 8% even entering the second half of 2003 when the recovery was well underway. So that's what I mean by too long. Uh, one symptom of the monetary expansion was the Fed's uh, target for the federal funds rate, the interbank overnight interest rate. Uh, beginning 2001, in the recession, the Fed funds rate was 6.25%. At the end of the year, it was down to 1.75%. So that's a huge drop in the Fed funds rate. And the Greenspan Fed pushed it even lower in 2002 and 2003. So by mid-2003, it was then at a record low of 1%, and it stayed there until 2004. Uh, now, that was a record then. Of course, currently, the Fed funds rate target is between 0% and a quarter of 1%, because I guess records are meant to be broken. Uh, and once again, we've begun a recovery, but the Fed funds rate has yet to rise. Inflation has started to rise. Uh, over the last 12 months, the CPI is up 3.6 percent, uh, last time I looked. Uh, but the Fed funds rate remains ultra low, so the Fed is again holding interest rates too low too long. So we have deja vu all over again. Uh, but of course, this recovery is a little more sluggish than the last one. And this recovery is more sluggish for reasons, I think, that have to do with the malinvestments that were made in the bubble that haven't been uh, completely cleaned out. And, of course, the great uncertainty about tax and regulatory policy uh, going forward that's leading investors to sit on the sidelines. So despite all the talk you hear about we need to stimulate consumption to get the recovery going, uh, consumption has recovered. It's investment that hasn't recovered. Okay, but back to my story. Um, during this uh, expansionary period, if you look at the real Fed funds rate, so take the Fed funds rate and subtract the inflation rate, it was negative for two and a half years. And that was unprecedented, but we're about to break that record too. Uh, and the Fed has promised to keep the Fed funds rate ultra low through 2013. Uh, a few weeks ago, they made that promise. But when the Fed funds rate, when interest rates are negative, what does that mean? It means they're paying you basically to borrow money. If you borrow money and just use it to hold on to land that stayed constant in real price, net of taxes, I guess, uh, you're being paid. You, you're able to pay back your loan in just out of the uh, keeping up with inflation of your house price. Uh, or land price. Or to put it another way, uh, if you buy a treasury bill with a negative real yield, of course you've got less wealth at the end of the period than at the start. If instead you'd taken the loan and bought a warehouse full of toilet paper, and the price of toilet paper keeps up with the inflation rate, you do better off. So toilet paper has a higher yield than treasury paper. 
uh, that's a negative interest rate. But in this case, it went not into toilet paper, it went into housing and land, um, and that's why there's such a run up in their prices. Now, I need to be a little more serious about this. Um, okay, the Fed expanded. How do we know whether it expanded too much? Right? Some expansion in the middle of a recession makes sense. Uh, if there's an unsatisfied demand for money, uh, people are hoarding money because it's in a recession and they're not very confident about spending. It makes sense to supply more money, but how much more? How do you know when you've gone too far? How do you know when you're distorting interest rates? Right? How do you know when the market rate is below equilibrium? That's actually a pretty tough question. I mean, if it were easy in real time to diagnose what the equilibrium interest rate would be, uh, assuming the market was not being disturbed, presumably even the Fed could get that right. But it's very difficult, in fact. You need a free financial market to reveal the correct interest rate. That's why we need competitive financial markets. Once you introduce a big player like the Fed into the market, <coughs> and they're trying to figure out what the interest rate would be if they weren't in the market, it becomes kind of a conundrum. It's hard to do. Uh, but let me give you some kind of rough guidelines, assuming that we don't have a completely free financial market, but we have this big player. Call it a sort of second best guideline for making uh, central bank policy as neutral as possible. Uh, one guideline would be, what, I think what I, the one I think is probably the best of the, of the, well, second best, uh, is to aim for stability in the volume of nominal expenditure. Uh, how many people have had uh, money in banking course? Okay. Well, a footnote for those people then. If you remember MV equals PY, I'm talking about holding MV constant. Um, and by the way, that means that the Fed should not be injecting money if people aren't hoarding but rather simply the economy is growing. Uh, and if you don't inject money, then prices begin to decline as output grows, uh, and that's okay. Uh, on this, I'm persuaded by George Selgin's book, Less Than Zero, The Case for Falling Prices in a Growing Economy, now available online as a free PDF download. And by saying that and by providing a tape of this lecture to George, I get a side payment. So. I needed to mention that. Uh, if we can't get stability of nominal expenditure, maybe steady growth, slow and steady growth would be third best. Uh, a prominent advocate of that policy is Scott Sumner on his blog, The Money Illusion, which is uh, interesting reading. So what's the best measure of nominal expenditure? Nominal GDP is probably the most popular. Uh, an alternative is to subtract net exports and change in business inventories from GDP in which you get uh, what's called the final sales to domestic purchasers. That's a series that is tracked by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis in their FRED database. And the database tells us that from 2001 to 2003, this measure, final sales to domestic purchasers, grew at a moderate rate. So in the initial phase of the recovery, 3.6% per year. But during 2003, the Fed's low interest rates began to be too low, and they're pumping in uh, demand to the system, pumping in nominal demand in the form of credit expansion. And the nominal growth rate of final sales jumps to 6.5%. And for the next two years, start of 2004 to the start of 2006, it rises to 7.1%. So there's a big run-up in, in demand. Uh, nearly double the earlier <coughs> growth rate. After that, after 2006, the Fed backs off a bit to 4.3 percent, but I think the damage from this expansion and the too low interest rates had already been done by that point. Now, the most popular guideline for judging Federal Reserve policy isn't nominal expenditure, but it's the Taylor Rule. And if you're not familiar with it, the Taylor Rule is a formula designed by an economist at Stanford named John Taylor. Uh, I kind of have a bone to pick with John Taylor because last week I was giving testimony before the Subcommittee on Domestic Monetary Policy and Technology uh, of Congress. And uh, 
there were only two congressmen in the room and no cameras uh, and no audience. And I said, where's the crowd for my hearing? Because this, this is exciting stuff I'm talking about. It turned out that down the hall, uh, John Taylor and Peter Schiff were testifying about the uh, debt crisis. And so that's where all the cameras and the congressmen and all the audience were. So I'm a little sore at John Taylor. But uh, back to the Taylor rule. So the Taylor rule takes what the current inflation rate is and what current real income is relative to the path it should be on, potential income, and then says, well, what should the Fed funds rate be, given that, to steer the economy back to uh, our target rate of inflation and our target path for real income? So suppose the target inflation rate is 2%. That's often spoken of as the preferred rate uh, for the Bernanke Fed or the, the rate within its comfort zone, it's sometimes said. Uh, the St. Louis Fed actually each month publishes a series in which you can see what the Taylor rate says the Fed funds rate ought to be if you're aiming at zero, one, two, three, or four percent inflation, and then what the Fed funds rate actually is. And it was well below that path, the, the Taylor rule estimated path consistent with 2% inflation, uh, basically from 2001 to 2006. So for five years, it was too low. And it was really too, too low between mid-2003 and mid-2005. It was more than two percentage points below. Right? So that's a major uh, injection of credit, cheapening credit in a major way. Um, if, if you take the guideline I suggested, Fed funds rate consistent with stability of nominal income, it's even farther below that path. So it's pumping up a bubble. Um, I don't know whether you saw Alan Greenspan on his uh, 2007 tour promoting the book he wrote after he left the Fed. Uh, I believe the title of the book was Not My Fault. <laughs> no, Age of Turbulence, Age of Turbulence. Um, he went on The Daily Show even. Uh, which, if you're like me, is your main source of news, so you may have seen that. Uh, and in the book and in the interview and other interviews, Greenspan defended himself against having inflated a credit bubble. And what was his defense? He said, well, it wasn't me. It was those darn Chinese and Japanese savers. Uh, the growth of credit in the U.S. market was due to an influx from the rest of the world, a global savings glut was the phrase that uh, Ben Bernanke used to describe this. So it's savers from other countries who are lowering the U.S. interest rate, not the Fed. Um, and his second line of defense was, you don't see any increase in the monetary aggregates, Greenspan said. Well, the second one is simply false. The first one, there is a small grain of truth to it. Uh, there is some evidence that there is influx of savings from abroad. We have the numbers of that on that. And you do see 30-year uh, interest rates in the U.S. fall by a little over one percentage point, 113 basis points if you measure it in hundredths of a percentage point. Uh, between 2001 and 2004, the inflation rate fell very little in that period, so that's mostly a fall in the real interest rate. And that's a good measure because the Fed's control over the Fed funds rate at the very short end of the maturity spectrum has very little effect at the 30-year end. Right? So that's a, a rough measure of how much international financial flows are lowering the interest rate. But the Fed funds rate fell by over 500 basis points, so that can't be explained by the influx of savings from abroad. Uh, so that's the amplification of cheap money. So it's not, maybe it's not the only cause of cheap money, but it amplifies it beyond the lower equilibrium that merely the uh, global savings glut would have uh, caused. And if you look at the Fed's, uh, the record, sorry, the minutes from the Fed's policy meetings at the time, what you see them basically saying is, well, look, uh, the economy is recovering, uh, inflation is low, and that means we can inject a lot more money now without worrying about price level inflation. Uh, we've got a lot more scope for pushing interest rates down, so let's do it. 
It's always attractive to do that. Right? But by lowering short-term interest rates, uh, the Fed created all this new credit. It not only increased the total uh, pool of mortgages, but it actually changed the type of mortgages that were being written. Uh, if you hold low uh, short-term interest rates down way below 30-year rates, you're going to make it more attractive for people to take out adjustable rate mortgages, which are typically indexed to the one-year treasury rate. And so the, the difference between those two rates, sort of the temptation to borrowers to give up the 30-year rate and take the one-year adjustable rate, uh, that gap basically doubled and the share of mortgages responded. The share of mortgages that were adjustable rates started this period at about 20%, about a fifth of new mortgages. It grew to about two-fifths of new mortgages. And this big new pot of uh, adjustable rate mortgages, those are the mortgages that have gotten into the most trouble. Okay. I mean, those are the borrowers who are having trouble paying back. Because when the period of cheap money ended, interest rates went back up, their mortgage interest payments went up, reset is the phrase that's used. Uh, they've been having trouble meeting their monthly payments. So that compounded the credit quality problems that were already bad enough because of the uh, over-enthusiasm for subprime mortgages. So let me speak more directly about the effect of low interest rates on housing prices. Uh, for you money and banking students or finance students, it's a present value calculation. If you've got a long-lived asset, the present value of it is the stream of payments over 30 years divided by one plus the interest rate uh, taken out to the 30th power. You've got 30 years worth of payments. The last one is discounted 30 years, one plus the interest rate to the 30th power. That's a lot of discounting. So a small change in the discount rate makes a big change in the present value of that payment. And the longer lived an asset is, the more its price is going to be affected by a change in the interest rate. Uh, so the dramatic fall in interest rates made for a dramatic rise in the what looked like the justified price uh, of these assets if you thought the low interest rates were going to continue. Uh, but we can put it another way, less sophisticated way. At a low interest rate, any given borrower can afford a bigger house, right? can afford a more expensive house because the monthly payment, uh, you can afford a bigger monthly payment uh, when interest rates are lower. So that means there's a tendency to bid up. People who could only afford small houses are now bidding on larger houses. They're driving up house prices. When there are only so many houses to go around, small houses now begin to sell for the price of medium-sized houses. But people are willing to pay those prices partly because they think the prices are going to continue to go up and it's better to buy now than later. Um, if you look at the data on how much real estate loans at commercial banks grew during this period, it was incredible. It was over 12% a year, right? There's hardly any way to um, make sense of that other than uh, it's artificial. I mean, there's not that big a growth in the population. Um, so that's driving up the demand for houses. That's driving up the price of houses. And it's encouraging the, the construction of new houses, of course. When house prices go up, then it pays to build new houses on undeveloped land. Um, and that took place to a great extent. Uh, Greenspan and Bernanke, of course, assured us that there's no such thing as a national bubble in housing. Uh, and, to some, and of course, the bubble was a lot worse. The prices rose a lot more in some markets than in others. But uh, if you fly into Las Vegas, look out of the plane window just before you land, uh, and you can see the residue of the Las Vegas housing bubble. So there certainly were local housing bubbles. You could see big tracks of half-built condominiums that were abandoned halfway through the building, right? Or laid out streets with no structures on them. Or if you have x-ray vision, you can see all the condos that were built and never occupied. Um, now, Greenspan has acknowledged that, well, maybe the 1% rate brought down the rate on adjustable rate mortgages and may have contributed to the rise in housing prices. But I've looked through his works, and that's the biggest admission I could find. Um, now, there's kind of a, a positive feedback loop. The rising house prices seem to turn the lead of junk mortgages, subprime mortgages, 
into gold, right? It looked like the risks were not as great as we had led to uh, had previously believed, uh, right? So long as house prices are rising, you can afford the payments even if you have no income because you can borrow against the rising equity in the house. And a lot of people did that, kept taking cash out of their house uh, to meet the growing, uh, to make, meet the monthly payments and figured on flipping the house later on to get some, make a profit on the whole deal. Um, and of course, a lot of the uh, junk mortgages were packaged together into mortgage-backed securities, and then they have to be sold to somebody. And why does somebody think that these are worth something? Well, because the default rate is currently very low. It's very low because house prices are rising, and when house prices are rising, people can afford these uh, mortgages even if they don't have much income uh, to back them up. And the banks, and this is where some of the private miscalculation comes in, uh, investment banks, other investors, sort of estimated models of default risk using only recent data in which defaults were in fact very low. So it was garbage in, garbage out. Uh, and the rating agencies apparently used the same kind of models. I should say the rating agency cartel uh, used the same kind of models and uh, treated these as AAA assets when of course they were far from AAA assets. So now what have we got? Now we've got an overbuilt housing stock, uh, which we're still working on. To work it off means letting the prices of houses fall, uh, but of course policymakers have done what they can to impede house prices from falling, um, and they've done what they can to try to find jobs for the construction workers that have laid off, but that's just slowing down the readjustment uh, process. And uh, the, the latest great idea is to, we've extended unemployment insurance to 99 weeks, the latest idea is to extend it even more. Right? Pay people to wait longer before they actually start seriously looking for a job. That's really not a recipe for speeding the adjustment process, quite the reverse. Let me turn to what the Fed did during the crisis. Um, during the crisis, the Fed started all kinds of new lending roles that it had never undertaken before. Uh, and it basically put together a shadow bailout program, very little reported on that was twice the size of the famous TARP program. TARP was a mere 700 billion. Uh, the Fed financed about oh, 1.4, 1.7 trillion in bailouts, by which I mean they are lending money on low terms uh, in order to fortify the capital of the borrowers, to help the borrowers survive. What's not a liquidity problem, but is an insolvency problem. Uh, and that kind of creative lending delays the resolution of the problem. It doesn't speed it up. Uh, right, so if you go back before 2008, I have some experience as a historian of antiquarian monetary institutions. So let's travel back in time to 2007. Uh, before 2008, the Fed very rarely uh, acted as a lender of last resort. Uh, the day after 9-11 would be an example where the Fed stands ready to lend if people are going to fly into cash. But monetary policy in normal times means control the quantity of money. And so you can think of lender of last resort as a part of monetary policy. It means don't let the money stock collapse. If people are hoarding cash, bank deposits would shrink. So stop that from happening. That's being a lender of last resort. Keep the money supply steady. And the way the Fed did that was traditionally to buy treasury securities, right? The Fed injects new bank reserves into the system by buying treasury securities because the person who sold him the bond now has a claim on the Fed. He deposits it in his bank. His bank now has a claim on the Fed. That's bank reserves. By buying treasury securities, the Fed avoids favoritism, right, uh, among private financial institutions. The quantity of loans the Fed made to financial institutions was trivial. It was less than half a billion at the end of 2007 on a balance sheet of 800 billion. There were no loans at all to other financial institutions, no loans to investment banks, brokerage houses, insurance companies, money market mutual funds, or foreign banks. That was just out of the question. The Fed didn't do that. 
2008, things changed uh, under the leadership of Ben Bernanke from Dillon, South Carolina, not far from here. Uh, what did, sorry? Same state. I don't, even, I don't actually know where it is. Where is Dillon? Okay. You see south of the border? Pedro Land. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Route 17. Uh, so the Fed started a new role, which was credit allocation, basically selectively channeling credit in the directions that it thought were meritorious. So it began making loans to banks that were overstocked with risky mortgage-backed securities. It began buying mortgage-backed securities from not just from commercial banks, from investment banks, from brokerage houses. It began making loans to insurance companies, to money market mutual funds, and to foreign banks. And some of the details have just come out. Right? There was Senator Bernie Sanders filed a Freedom of Information Act request. Uh, Bloomberg.com uh, did also. And now we started to get, have started to get some of the details of who all the borrowers were. Uh, but in all these programs, the Fed is saying, well, we think that investment banks need 400 billion. We think that money market mutual funds are entitled to 200 billion. And so they're allocating credit. Uh, it's usually not to individual firms. Many of these are auction facilities, but they're making money available at below market interest rates. So it's a subsidy to the favored sets of financial institutions. There's no congressional oversight of this process, right? Trying to audit the Fed after the fact is the most courage Congress can muster on this, and they haven't even voted for a complete audit. Uh, this has nothing to do with acting as a lender of last resort, because you can do that just by buying treasuries. If you're buying other stuff, it's because you want to support the price of the other stuff. Um, and the same is true of what we've just heard about last week, where the Fed is extending swap lines to European central banks to lend to their own banks that have dollar uh, liabilities. I, uh, I don't know if you've read the press releases about this. The Fed said, we have to alleviate the shortage of dollars in Europe. Now, apparently the Fed never took, uh, whoever wrote the press release, never took microeconomics one, or is it 101? Uh, where shortage is defined as there's not enough to go around at the going price. There are plenty of dollars if you're willing to pay the going price. U.S. banks are awash with dollars, right? They're sitting on trillion, literally more than a trillion dollars in excess reserves, which they would be happy to lend if they got a good interest rate on it from a borrower who was promising to credibly to pay them back. The problem with the European banks is they can't make a credible promise to pay it back because they're on very shaky ground. So what there's a shortage of is people willing to lend the money <laughs> at an artificially low interest rate, and that's where the Fed steps in. Uh, so these new activities are basically a, a grab bag of bailouts uh, aimed at protecting domestic banks, even non-banks, even foreign banks, basically from the consequences of their own mistakes in investing in mortgage-backed securities. And that's what the quantitative easing one, QE1, was about. The Fed spent about uh, 1.25 trillion buying mortgage-backed securities in order to relieve the institutions that had them uh, from holding them. Now, at the same time, the Fed didn't want the money supply to expand in the same proportion. So the Fed's basically doubling its own liabilities. It doesn't want the money supply to double because that would make the price level double, and 100% inflation would probably make the Fed unpopular. So what did they do? They started paying banks interest on reserves. So if you think of it as a bundle, buy the mortgage-backed securities from the banks and pay the banks to hold reserves in order to sterilize the operation, it's not really monetary policy. It doesn't affect M1 or M2. It's fiscal policy, right? The Fed is borrowing money and spending it, spending it on buying these dodgy assets. Uh, so the Fed is conducting a fiscal policy operation much like the Treasury did in the Great Depression. Uh, under the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Uh, but at least the RFC was voted on by Congress. The Fed's program was never voted on by Congress. Congress only has a vague idea about what's happening. Now, if you wanted to defend the, the Fed's procedure, you might say, well, they had to do something, and they had to do it quickly, and it helped the economy, didn't it? Uh, I'm not sure it helped the economy. I think it mostly just removed the bad assets from the bank balance sheets 
and loaded them onto the taxpayer's balance sheet, right? Because they're now in the Fed's balance sheet. It certainly worsened the moral hazard problem, the problem of too big to fail. Uh, this is kind of a under the table too big to fail. Uh, and basically, I think the decision to keep everybody afloat, solvent or insolvent, uh, well, with the one exception of Lehman, and uh, it's basically creating a race of undercapitalized financial institutions. Back in the savings and loan crisis, we called these kind of undercapitalized institutions that were still roaming the landscape, feeding off the living, we called them zombie banks. Right? Um, I mean, it, it hasn't made the banks healthy enough to resume lending. Right? Their capital constraint is now the, the binding constraint on them. So I think we're repeating the mistake Japan made in their lost decade, actually it's more like 15 years, uh, after their housing bubble collapsed in the 1980s, they kept all the banks afloat, but the banks were not, not in a position, not healthy enough to really lend, uh, except to keep up their mortgage, their, their real estate loans that were non-performing. So that's not helping, that's just dragging out the adjustment process. All right, so what should we doing? What should we be doing? I guess I need to uh, come to a conclusion here. Uh, on bank failures, basically uh, resolve the situation. Uh, I'm a fan of the Victorian banking theorist Walter Badgett, who famously said, you do want to keep the money supply from collapsing, but you don't want to rescue insolvent institutions. Uh, and the Fed has disregarded the second half of that advice. Right? So the Fed should not be conducting bailouts. Uh, what about monetary policy? Well. We can talk about how to improve monetary policy within the existing institutional framework. As I was suggesting earlier, maybe trying to stabilize nominal expenditure would be less bubble prone than uh, whatever the Fed's been doing now, right? They're having a, a sort of dual mandate between trying to keep inflation from getting too high and trying to keep unemployment from getting too high and not really seriously committed to either one. Uh, I mean, we could try to advise the Fed to act with more restraint, but, you know, free advice is usually valued at the price. Uh, the Fed is pursuing its own objectives. Uh, the temptation to pursue them is too great for them to be persuaded by mere talk. So I think if we're going to be serious about it, we need to consider alternative institutions, uh, alternative arrangements in which there's no longer a central bank that has the power to expand uh, credit irresponsibly. So either credibly tie the central bank's hands or my favorite reform, uh, do away with the central bank, uh, move to a monetary system in which there is no central bank, but instead we have a decentralized monetary system, free banking uh, on a commodity standard. Let's see how much I can say about that in the next two minutes. Uh, now, did you say I should stop at 1.50 or should I should go 50 minutes? Because we started about five after. Uh, wrap up so that we can have an additional Okay, just in case I've said anything controversial. Uh, let, me, let me end with this sort of peroration then. Uh, after the panic of 1907, uh, history lesson here, Congress convened what they called the National Monetary Commission. So. Everybody basically understood that the status quo wasn't working. Uh, financial panics were not a good thing, and a serious regime change was going to be needed to improve the system going forward. That was great. Unfortunately, what they gave us, what this commission gave us, was a central bank instead of uh, trying deregulation, which if they had looked at the banking system in Canada, they might have realized was a better way to solve the problem. But today, we're in the shadow of the panic of 2007. I think we have just as much reason as they did in 1911 to con conclude that our system is broken and something needs to be done to fix it. I I'm hoping that this time around, uh, the message will get out that our experiment with the Federal Reserve System hasn't turned out so well. Uh, maybe we should try sound money through market discipline, through free banking, banking without artificial restrictions, but also without privileges, guarantees, or bailouts, so that banks will behave more responsibly. Uh, 
and money regulated by market forces of supply and demand instead of by a single big player trying to foresee what um, is the best monetary policy, by market forces instead of by a central bank. So a system in which commercial banks would be responsible for issuing all kinds of money and they would be pinned by a commodity standard like a gold standard without the need for uh, the wisdom of Ben Bernanke. So let me uh, conclude there and take questions. Thanks very much. Okay, so there had been a series of financial panics um, in the period between the Civil War and 1913, uh, the panic in 1907 being the last and the biggest of them. Um, and basically, it was a problem of legal restrictions that weakened the U.S. banking system. I mentioned Canada, and, and I think that's the best evidence that it wasn't inherent to a system of decentralized note issue, which the U.S. had, but it was, and Canada also had, because Canada didn't have the problems. The problems were due to the U.S. having banks limited to a single state each, or at most a single state. In some states, banks were only allowed to have one office. Uh, and of course, we had these restrictions on interstate banking for a long time after that, not until the 90s did they start to uh, crumble. Uh, and there was a restriction on the ability of banks to issue more currency in times of the year when business wanted more currency. For example, when farmers wanted to pay their farmhands. So, let's see if I can do this without getting too deep into the weeds. Basically, in the fall, farmers would come to the bank and say, I need some currency to pay my farmhands. And the bank would say, well, under the National Banking Act, we can't issue any more banknotes. We're up, up to our limit. And the farmer would say, okay, in that case, I'll take greenbacks or I'll take silver certificates. And, but those are not liabilities of the bank, those are reserves. So the demand for currency becomes a reserve drain. Whereas north of the border, the bank said, you want to change from deposit liabilities to having more banknotes? Fine, we reduce one liability, we increase another liability. There's no change in bank reserves. But in the U.S., it becomes a drain of bank reserves. The banks in the countryside then pulling, begin pulling reserves from the cities the cities begin pulling reserves from New York, and now New York has a problem. And so all the big panics take place in the fall. Uh, it's a scramble for reserves, basically. Uh, I did a paper with George Selgin in which we had two time series plots. One is interest rates in the US, and they go up every fall because of this problem. And in the worst cases, panic breaks out. In Canada, the quantity of banknotes goes up every fall and then comes back down again. And interest rate series is pretty flat. They didn't have this restriction that they had in the U.S., which said if you want to issue more notes, you have to have federal bonds to back them. And the reason for that uh, collateral requirement uh, was the Civil War, or as my uh, horse and buggy driver called it yesterday, the War of Northern Aggression. <laughs> uh, in the War of Northern Aggression, uh, the Union government said, we need to borrow money. Who can we get to buy our bonds? Well the banks. They've got money, so we'll tell them if you want a federal bank charter, you have to buy federal bonds. And so the, quant the quantity of banknotes was linked to the quantity of federal bonds available, and that quantity of bonds available for backing notes was fixed, basically. Actually, it was declining as the Civil War debt was paid down. Uh, so the supply of notes was inelastic was the term they used. It, it couldn't move seasonally. In Canada, there wasn't any restriction of that kind. Um, so they've been talking, did we skip three? Yeah, Q3, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they've, they've been talking about trying to act on long-term bond rates, and I think they've actually started. So this would just be a, a sort of amplification of that. All right, so if we can't bring short-term rates down anymore, well, let's buy long-term bonds and bring long-term rates down. It uh, doesn't strike me as a very promising way forward. I mean. The, the problem at this point is not that there's a shortage of 
uh, reserves in the banking system, right? And it's not that the yield curve is too steep. I mean, the fact that longer term rates are well above short term rates uh, is partly a result of the Fed acting mostly on short term rates, but partly a result of inflation expectations. And buying more 30 year bonds is not gonna change that. Uh, I mean, right now we've got this huge overhang of excess bank reserves. I think that's part of the uncertainty that uh, is sort of hanging over the market. It's part of the reason why the price of gold's been going up for the last two years. Uh, part of the reason that the dollar's been dropping in foreign exchange markets. So creating a bigger overhang doesn't seem to me to be the, the way forward. I know they're desperate to revive investment, but I think the sluggishness of investment has more to do with the regime uncertainty of uh, taxes and regulations. Uh, and so it's more a matter for getting the fiscal house in order. I mean, I didn't even talk about the fiscal problems in the U.S., but I mean, that's the, there, I'd say there are two real threats to sound money going forward. One is the Federal Reserve, and the other is the rest of the federal government, right, which is creating this ballooning debt, and in the long run, countries with big debts tend to inflate it away. I mean, it's what the U.S. did after World War II. If you look at how the debt was actually relieved after World War II, about half of it was inflated away. Uh, so creating a bigger threat of high inflation doesn't seem to me to be the way to reassure investors. Yeah? What is the case and the reasoning behind the 2% annual inflation rate of 15 seconds? Why not zero? Well, zero makes more sense to me, but I can tell you what the, the reasoning is, or actually what makes most sense to me is stabilize nominal income and let prices fall as productivity grows because that's the most like uh, what the gold standard did. But I can tell you the reasoning behind 2%. It's that, oh, it's so small that hardly anybody notices, but it gives you more flexibility to uh, change prices. Uh, the argument is that workers are resistant to uh, wage cuts in nominal terms but if you have 2% inflation, you can cut their wages by 2% in real terms without changing the nominal wage. Uh, and this is, there's a paper by Ackerloff, Perry, and Dickens of, I don't know, 20 years ago that makes this very explicitly. But I think that's kind of in the back of the mind of a lot of people who think that 2% uh, is better than zero. I mean, officially the Fed's view is anything between zero and 2% is okay. But of course, all their mistake, all their errors, all their missing of that target has been on the high side. Uh, Bernanke, Bernanke has this view, uh, well, maybe this is an alternative to the rationale I just gave you. Bernanke has this view that anytime you go below zero, you know, all hell breaks loose. Uh, you get sucked into a black hole of debt deflation. So you want to err on the side of positive inflation, so that if the inflation rate turns out to be a little higher or a little lower than you were shooting at, if you're aiming at 2%, at least you won't fall into the negative zone. I think that he has more or less said that in some of his speeches. So if you have 2% inflation, then you have, he's also said this, which is sort of consistent with that, you also have more scope to cut interest rates when the economy needs boosting. Well, um, you mentioned the Constitution is interesting. Of course, uh, some people, constitutional scholars, uh, have yet to find a uh, clause in the Constitution that authorizes the Federal Reserve Act. But putting that aside, uh, what the Fed did during the crisis is not even consistent with the Federal Reserve Act. Right? The Federal Reserve Act authorizes them to uh, buy notes of uh, financial institutions, but it doesn't authorize them to uh, buy shares in financial institutions or 
acquire ownership positions in financial institutions. So I don't know if you followed this, but uh, some of the most interesting reading over the past few years has been on the Fed's balance sheet, which they publish every week. And the, the number of footnotes explaining all these new lines on the balance sheet has gotten longer and longer. And when the Fed intervened in the Bear Stearns case, the New York Fed basically bought $30 billion worth of assets, uh, which is not, it's hard to find any justification for that in the Federal Reserve Act. Even if you read between the lines and off the edge of the page, it's hard to find it. Um, created a new subsidiary in order to do that. I guess their lawyers told them this has the fig leaf of legality. So the Fed itself did not buy the assets. Their subsidiary called Maiden Lane, LLD, LLC, bought the assets. Uh, anyway, going forward, um, this is one of those crises in which the old rules were just ignored, and now we're all accustomed to it. So when the Fed announced last week, we're going to make $400 billion available to European central banks, nobody batted an eye, right? Oh, well, that's, they did that during the crisis, and so, sure, I can do it again. Um, Congress just is enormously deferential to the Fed when it comes to, uh, you guys are the experts, you, know, you seem to know what you're doing. Uh, for us to do any research, that would, we can't do that. Uh, so I, I don't see much coming down the pike that would uh, restrain the Fed in any serious way. I mean, if they can't even pass the uh, serious audit the Fed bill, uh, that's pretty discouraging. Very well, time.